I am Alison McFarlane. I'm chair of the Royal Statistical Society um, uh, official statistics section, which is um, one of the two joint organisers of this series of spe uh, seminars. Um, we've been going since the beginning of the pandemic and um, uh, the aim has been to bring together people from the four nations of the UK um, to talk about the work that they have done and published. And so far, what we've neglected is um, the huge amount of work being done at local level and the way that these uh, complement each other. Um, so that's the theme for today's um, seminar, webinar. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the Royal Statistical Society virtually, because obviously none of us are sitting in Errol Street. And um, handing over to um, our co-organiser, Dina Ledbetter, who is chair of the official uh, health statistics user group, who is going to do the real job of uh, chairing the webinar. So I hope you enjoy it. Was, we have a huge amount of material being presented and more will be appearing on the web um, website um, because um, it's quite detailed. Uh, very glad to welcome you. Over to Dina. Great. Thanks very much, Alison. And as always, thanks very much to the RSS for, for hosting this. Um, can we just have the next slide, please, Luz? Um, OK, which is just really saying that this is intended to run from, from 12 until 1.30 with the present presentations in the first um, hour and then the Q&A for hopefully for the, the last half hour. Um, this is the eighth, I think, if I'm counting in, in this series. Um, so, as Alison said, we're sort of moving. I mean, the pandemic is far from over, but obviously we're sort of now looking maybe broader in terms of looking at the, the local work. And also for the next one, we're kind of looking back over the pandemic as well. So we have a very um, full programme with a very um, interesting set of speakers. Um, so um, we we need to um, move ahead. So just a few um, housekeeping things for me to start. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So um, as with all of these usual with these webinars, if uh, everyone can stay muted or will be muted throughout the webinar, uh, we have the chat function enabled. And if you have any questions, please put them in there. And Manira will be monitoring that during the presentations and then she will then lead the Q&A session. So if it's if it's a question, please put it at the start. And if it's particularly aimed at somebody, please put that speaker. And we do welcome other comments because this is a sharing exercise. Speakers obviously sharing with us and with each other. But we know that many of the participants also have much to bring to the discussion. So if you've got comments or, or links to something that you think might be of interest, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, all the presentations will be available afterwards. There is a tremendous amount of material in the presentations and also some fuller presentations are actually going to be posted on the website that we haven't got, people haven't got time to go through now. So um, you won't be able to read everything now, but it will be available on the website by tomorrow morning, we hope. And also the session is being recorded for you to look at afterwards, but also if you've got colleagues who you think might find it interesting, you can... Um, point them in the direction of the recording. So um, that will probably just take a couple of days to get up there, but uh, keep an eye on that. We'll let you know when that's available. Uh, next slide, please. This, um, we always start with just a sort of comment about how these webinars are run and, and the values. Um, the, the whole purpose of this webinar series is collaboration and working together. And, and we hope that um, this uh, shared work will improve what everyone is able to do um, and that we hope that this is going to be successful in terms of moving forward. So um, this is the, the values that underpin um, the webinar series and also our continued discussions. We're talking about posting the information on the website. There's opportunities there to make comments and continue the discussions. So we see this just as a start. There's a lot in here that you may want to follow up with. Um, in the Q&A session, um, we, we also allow the speakers a little bit more time to respond. So 
if they're not able to respond um, it, it, during the, the short time we have, they may also uh, send comments afterwards. And all of that is captured and will be on the website. So um, that's probably enough in terms of the housekeeping. So we move on to the next slide, which is the speakers. Um, so we have some um, very interesting range of speakers. Um, Mark Green from University of Liverpool, Neil from Manchester, Corrie from NHS Grampian and um, Alison from Lanarkshire and Lucy from Buckinghamshire. But as you would have seen on the introductory slide, there's um, a considerable number of organisations involved here. But when you actually see what the speakers are talking about, there are many other organisations. So the number of organisations involved in this uh, webinar is, is quite, um, quite huge. So it's very much collaboration and working together. Um, the way we work this is we will actually run all the way through um, each presentation and then we take the Q&A at the end. So there won't be a gap between speakers. Um, I think that's probably enough for me because what you'll hear is here to hear is um, about the presentations. So I'll hand over to Mark, uh, Mark Green from Liverpool, who's our first speaker. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for coming uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak. So my name is Mark and I'm going to talk about local data spaces in 10 minutes or so. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to cover in this short talk is what local data spaces was, I'll talk a bit about how we engage with local authorities, and then I'll talk a bit about reflections over what went well, what didn't go so well, and things that can be taken forward for how we work with local partners. Next slide, please. So if we're trying to think about what the problem local data spaces have set up to address, uh, one of the biggest issues we've probably faced during the pandemic was making sure that we got the right types of data and the right types of answers from those data into the right hands at the right time to be able to make effective decisions. And of course, being able to do this means that we need to open up our access to data all across the, the health system. Now, there's been a lot of progress being made across very many different parts of the UK in terms of data linkages, in terms of improving access to data feeds, setting up dashboards, trying to make this data readily available um, to whoever need it, whether that's citizens in the public or whether that's local authorities. At the same time, you know, there's been a lot of progress being made, but local authorities have faced you know, 10 years of kind of cuts, the legacy of austerity, which has meant that they don't necessarily always now have the technical expertise to be able to make the best use of all of this opening up of data sources to them. At the same time, um, no, local authorities might not necessarily have the time or the resources to make the best of these things. So of course, they might be stretched in terms of the services that are trying to um, provide to local citizens or the decisions that they're trying to make. So whilst the data and the skills they might have is within the system, within their local authority, they might not always have the time, the space to make the best use of them as well. What we wanted to kind of explore really is how can we help local authorities make the best use of all of this data out there? We've got incredible sources of information. In theory, we can have a lot of value being taken out of these data. How can we help local authorities make the best use of that? And we explored that by looking at academic partnerships. So how could we facilitate relationships with academics to local authorities to help them make the best use of these data sources? Next slide, please. So with that in mind, local data spaces were set up. It was set up as a pilot. It ran uh, only for six months at the end of 2020, early 2021. And it was set up with uh, the promise of, we don't know if this is going to work. It might fail uh, handsomely. But we're going to see if is this a useful service to provide. In particular, what our aim was, was really to try and help local authorities make best use of data. And we decided to focus on data sets held within trusted researcher environments, particularly focusing on the ONS's secure research service, which makes access to things like mortality records, uh, health and social surveys, sensitive data, widely accessible to accredited researchers. We selected that because we knew from the ONS's work that not many local authorities were using this service and it might allow them to gather data and evidence differently and allow them to make different decisions, not just relying on what data they already had access to in their local systems. 
the way that we sort of engaged with local authorities was really through two main approaches. Next slide, please. So the first model really is that we spoke to local authorities, we talked to a lot of them and where we decided that, you know, that they show that they were engaged and that they had a sufficient technical um, and time resources available to make best use of the trusted researcher environments. We helped them put in an application to the Secure Research Service. So we worked with them, told them a bit of mentoring around what to write. Um, and this allowed them then to access data that they weren't accessing before um, and allowed them then to conduct their own analysis and use data very differently to how they were kind of going about things. So for example, we worked with Hackney London Borough and we helped them put in an application to the SRS because they were really interested in the implications of COVID-19 on work patterns in particular. What would happen if someone had to isolate for 10 days, two weeks? How does that then impact on their work, their employment? What if they're self-employed? What's the impact on there? And is there a sort of cycle of disadvantage that comes about this? So that was our kind of main approach, but unfortunately most local authorities didn't have this kind of resource or technical expertise to make the best use of their trusted research environment. So we ended up having to focus on our other particular model. Next slide, please. So our other approach was that where we spoke to local authorities and they were really interested in trying to make better use of their data or access new types of data, um, but didn't necessarily have that technical time or financial resource to make best use of it, we would spend a lot of time co-producing research questions with them. So we'd sit down with them, we'd talk about what they wanted to find, the types of uh, research that they wanted doing, and then we would go into the ONS's Secure Research Service ourselves, and we would do that analysis on their behalf. We'd then take the results of that analysis, the data insights, and we'd go back to local authorities and say, here you go, this is what we found. Is this matching what you wanted to find? Is this set up to you know, be useful to you? And it would be an iterative process in which we would go to them, we'd have a conversation, work out what we want to do next, go and do that analysis. And it allowed us to kind of refine what we were doing to best meet what they wanted. And the success of this meant that local authorities could use that data set held within these trusted research environments, even though they didn't have the time or the resources to make best use of it. So they got some insights out of that data indirectly from the work that we did. We also, because this co-production process was really time intensive, decided that if we could run any analysis for one local authority, we could do that for any local authority in England. And so what we do is just simply set up analyses on a for loop and we would just run them through all local authorities across England on the assumption that they probably all are asking similar questions. And then we would produce thematic reports automatically within the system that would just be generated from these analyses and we made them openly available. Um, so they're all available on the Consumer Data Research Centre website. If you go on the GeoData Packs, for all 314 local authorities in England, we've made reports available up to um, 10 reports at the minute. So, for example, we've been working with Market Harbour, who are really interested in footfall and the impact on their retail town centre. Um, we've also done some more specific things, looking at inequalities in lateral flow testing related to the Liverpool mass testing, but also more broader than that, um, and a whole range of things around occupational inequalities in health. Next slide, please. So I just kind of wanted to end with kind of some of the, what went well, what didn't go so well with lo working with local authorities. And then I think in particular, how do we build these connections between maybe national efforts, um, and how do we work with multiple local authorities? Certainly when we spoke to a lot of local authorities, so we ran surveys, focus groups, we talked to a lot of local authorities, they really did say that this was useful and actually trying to build academic partnerships was really helpful for them because they often didn't necessarily have the time or the space to do these types of research. They were often say they were in firefighting mode. So this was very good, but at the same time, building those relationships, working with local authorities was really difficult. In particular, co-producing research questions is just hard. And um, there was cultural barriers, in particular, what I thought of as certain words meant didn't necessarily translate well to local authorities. And local authorities were also concerned that academics didn't always know how they worked. And so working through those cultural barriers and thinking about how we can work together and that we're talking on the same terms, taking a bit of time to, to, to work those things out first really helped pay dividends later on when we're doing those things. 
In particular, what we found is actually whilst we go to the crunches and say, what do you want? You know, what kind of evidence would you need? They'd say, well, just give us everything, everything. Any data you can give us is useful. But that itself isn't particularly helpful for coming up with research questions or going into the SRS and doing analysis when you can do everything, you can do nothing. So a lot of times actually going in, getting a broad remit of what they're interested in, doing a bit of analysis, bit of descriptive analysis and going back to them and actually saying, well, what is this? Is this useful? It made it a bit more real. And particularly with trusted researcher environments, it's really hard to know what data is in there and what can be done because you can't see the data. It's really hard for a local authority to know what can be done. So making things real really did help. At the same time, um, you know, putting in applications to the SRS was really time consuming, really difficult for local authorities. We only had really one successfully apply because the, the application form was really intimidating, particularly getting all of the kind of systems and security procedures in place. Um, and, you know, that was something we fed back to the ONS is that if you want to scale these things up, you need to provide a lot of support to local authorities who might not have that technical expertise to make the best use of them. Next slide, please. So that's pretty much everything for local data spaces or banged into about 10 minutes. Um, I'd just like to end by saying thank you to all of our partners. You know, Local Data Spaces was allowed because we worked with the ONS who provided support with working with the SRS through um, the Department of Health and Social Care in helping us engage with local authorities, through ADR UK ESRC for funding us and providing mentorship, and also through all the researchers part of the Consumer Data Research Centre who seconded um, to the programme. It was really a, a big effort and of course if you're going to do these things they require a lot of resources to support. It's not just um, necessarily these things can be done very easily, it requires a big team. So thank you for listening, I'm happy to take any questions um, later on. Great, thank you very much Mark. I mean very very interesting project this and as with all the things we've talked about during the Covid, I mean there's a lot of learning that we hope we're going to be able to take forward when we eventually come out of the pandemic. This is something that's not specific to Covid, this is something that's obviously really helpful. So thank you for that. Uh, a reminder to everyone that you can put your questions in chat um, as the speakers are talking so that we've got those ready for the Q&A at the end. So now um, I'll hand over to the next speaker, which is Neil Bendel from Manchester, who's who's talking about um, the academic side of things and uh, students, which is obviously another aspect to it. So, uh, Neil, over to you. OK, thank you, Dina. Um, so in, in line with the kind of theme of the um, webinar, there are um, three broad things that I uh, want to talk about. Um, firstly, about how how we've used data that's been provided by national organisations, notably uh, what is now UK Health Security Agency, to uh, improve the way we've been able to deliver our response to COVID for specific um, groups within our, our population, in this case, students. Um, secondly, how we've been able to add value to what um, we've been able to get from um, UK HSA and others um, by combining that data with information and insight we've had from other partners. Um, and thirdly, um, what the kind of key lessons are that we've learned from this. Uh, next slide, please. So just by way of, uh, of context, uh, why is this important for us in Manchester? Well, we've got a very large student population, uh, both national and international students at undergraduate and postgraduate level uh, at three major universities, um, but a number of smaller specialist college institutions as well. Um, and we've also got students from universities in neighbouring authorities who live in the city. Um, we've got a range of different accommodation types, as other student cities will have. Um, there are large university owned halls of residences, um, purpose-built student accommodation blocks that are uh, run and managed by uh, private providers and also um, an awful lot of students living in the uh, private rented sector, uh, particularly in second and third years uh, onwards. Um, and they are predominantly located around the city centre and towards the south of the city. Um, some of that um, data which is, is collected nationally for surveillance purposes may not fully reflect some of that local nuance um, around increased transmission. Um, so therefore, it's really important for us that we're able to triangulate this local data and intelligence to help us 
um, identify and manage outbreaks at the earliest possible um, opportunity. Next slide, please. So this, this just kind of illustrates the um, dangers, I suppose, of not having such processes in, 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 in places. Um, in the, at the beginning of the autumn term 2020, so towards the middle of September and into the beginning of October, there were significant outbreaks of COVID-19 in universities and higher education settings, uh, notably in a number of um, halls of residence. Um, and at its peak, there were nearly 3,000 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in that student age group, so 17 to 21 year olds, um, in, in a seven day period. So this was something that we were very conscious of um, when it came to the beginning of the um, autumn term 2021. Next slide, please. So we were very keen to kind of, when the um, academic year 2021-22 um, um, you know, came along, um, to uh, be much more on the front foot than we were um, in the previous academic year in terms of setting up a local programme of support to universities and higher education providers in Manchester in advance of those students coming back into the city. So from a data point of view, um, we undertook a lot of preparatory work uh, in the summer, uh, in, in July, um, cleaning and organising some of our data, liaising with colleagues just to make sure that we had a proper list of accommodation. We were able to feedback that offer back to universities themselves part of a webinar that we held in August. And then from September onwards, um, we started to establish the set of um, initially thrice weekly, but then gradually reducing over time uh, meetings of what we call uh, data triangulation meetings with university colleagues and people from other bits of the Manchester Test and Trace system to make sure that we were um, constantly on top of and able to respond to that data. Next slide, please. In, in, in the course of doing that, um, there was, uh, we realised there were lots of different data that we were able to use to support this, this, this piece of work. And none of those individually had um, told, us the, told us the full picture. Um, so a key part of this work was very much on the triangulation of data and insight from different sources, including the information that we were getting through from UKHSA, information which the, which the universities themselves were collecting based on um, self-reported um, information coming from their students, um, from that information which was then being fed back into our central coordination hub, um, and then uh, equally um, triangulate that with what are happening in other parts of Greater Manchester as well. So we're able to use um, a range of different sources in order to give us a fuller picture of what was going on. Next slide, please. So how do we use those data? Well, we were able to look at the data and, if you like, um, slice and dice that data in different ways to look at um, things from a number of different approaches. We were able to look directly at, at accommodation. Um, so um, by matching the data at postcode level, we were able to identify um, positive, taste, positive tests in different forms of accommodation. Um, because our universities um, at the beginning of the year had a number of um, dedicated test sites where they were testing um, offering testing to students and staff. We were able to look at the results coming back from those test sites. Um, because we know that there are a number of areas in Manchester that have very high numbers of students, particularly in areas like Fallowfield and Rush Home, we were able to look at those places um, as well to, to look at um, not just the, the students, but also potential transmission of cases from those students into the wider population. Um, able to look at potential points of exposure, working with our environmental health team to look at particular uh, businesses, particularly in the hospitality sector that we know um, catered uh, mainly for students um, and also um, the university as a, as a workplace in itself. So, by, so we, in, order to, in order to get that full picture, we were able to combine all those different sets of, sets of data together, not in the form of directly linking them, but in terms of um, looking at things alongside each other to get that fuller picture. Next slide, please. So key to all of this was what we called our university data triangular meetings, which initially started three times a week. And then um, as uh, based on um, the um, information we were getting back, we were able to step up or step down those meetings, depending on what was the feedback we were getting. So these meetings were very much to allow us to understand the overall impact 
of the return of the students to the city um, through that triangulation of insight from different sources um, to allow us to identify and speedily respond to outbreaks and situations um, in accommodation settings and also to facilitate the, the, the facilitation of contact tracing and where needed um, humanitarian and student welfare support to students um, as we were able to do um, in the previous um, the previous uh, uh, academic year. Next slide, please. So this is the example of one of our products in terms of our surveillance dashboard, um, in terms of uh, being able to track over time the numbers of positive cases um, based on um, the, on accommodation. Um, so um, based on students, student households, so which we call um, largely um, um, council tax uh, data on properties where there was a student council tax exemption that we suspected were um, student rental properties. Um, other provider halls, which are those in the private sector, um, and halls that were specifically linked to individual um, universities. Um, so this doesn't give us the, the full picture, it's one particular element of that. Obviously, students who are living at home um, wouldn't be covered within this. So it just gives an idea of one particular element of where we'll be able to look at this. Next slide. And this is just an example of one of our, our drill down um, menus where we we're able to look at individual halls, um, by um, the uh, institution that manage those halls and to look at over time, individual days and weeks, how many positive tests we were able to see that were linked to one of those accommodation settings. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of how this kind of worked in practice with one particular uh, instance that we had um, of, of the group, um, whereby um, through the dashboard that you've, you've just seen, we were identified a particular case within a, a halls of residence at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, because um, we were able to share that information at the um, university's um, data investigation meeting, um, it became aware through that meeting that Manchester Metropolitan University themselves hadn't come across that case through their own surveillance channel. Because we had an information sharing agreement in place, we were able to share the information about that potential case with the university through secure email transfer, and the MMU was then able to investigate their own records. Um, and um, it then subsequently came to light that the potential student was was an ex-student, um, where their effectively their address hadn't been um, hadn't been um, changed. Um, so then we were able to identify that no further action was was needed. Um, but again, it could have been um, the, the opposite um, thing that happened where. Um, it was something that did need action. Um, so the surveillance of the positive tests um, and the frequency of the nature of the meeting meant, and the IG we had in place meant we were able to do this sort of work. Next slide, please. So what did, what's our reflections on this process in terms of what it, um, it, it contributed to us? Well, it helped us to develop those partnerships across the higher education sector, um, and to build those links between the universities and, and, and the council um, in a way which um, we may not have had at, at earlier stages of, of the pandemic. Um, increased our, our technical knowledge as a team around things like address linkages, our understanding of council tax data as well, for example, um, which was key to us trying to understand um, uh, cases in the uh, private rented sector uh, in the community. Um, as I mentioned, it approved our ability to respond to situations in an agile fashion um, and to share data between us. Um, going forward, there will be an ongoing benefit for in terms of recovery and the wider analysis. Um, students are a, a key part of our population uh, and we very much see them as part of our city, our population. Um, so it's, it's important that we understand their health needs and requirements going forward. And some of the partnerships that we were able to establish will help us to do that. Um, from a partnership point of view from the universities, um, it gave them reassurance that they weren't working alone, um, that they're able to, um, that the data that they were seeing um, to a large extent reflected and matched the information that we were seeing, and also that the information that we were getting through um, matched what, in, in broad terms, what the universities themselves were seeing. So that real reassurance that um, individually, um, we were seeing one thing, but collectively, what we were all seeing was um, broadly similar in terms of um, issues. 
Um, and it did add, as I say, we hope this will add value to national data. Um, so we're able to match tests um, to our local knowledge of where student residences were and able to understand um, where tests were linked to a specific student residence, which is obviously not something that nationally um, um, we would expect UKHSA or NHS Test and Trace to be able to do. Now, I think that's um, um, it for the presentation. Happy to take um, questions when they come in later on in the webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, Neil. And um, in the pack that's going to go on to the website, there will be more detail than uh, Neil's been able to go through here. Um, and I and I love the sort of final comment about adding value to the national data. There's so much that's, that you can see from these presentations, and I think we're going to see in the, ne the next three of what can be done at local level, which really does support and enhance and link in with the national level. So they're very complementary. So thank you, Neil. And if we now move on, we have two speakers from Scotland. First of all, um, Corrie, Corrie Black from NHS Grampian, um, who's talking about the local work, but how it, it links in with the national work and lessons from COVID. So over to you, Corrie. Thank you very much. Um, so, hello, I'm Corey Black. I, and I work for NHS Grampian as a consultant in public health, but I'm also a professor for our Centre of Health Data Science <laughs> at the University of Aberdeen. So spanning some of the networks and organisations we've just heard about. Next slide, please. And just to give you a little framing for the talk that I'm going to go through today. So um, we're in Grampian. Uh, in Scotland, public health is still part of the NHS rather than local authority based. Uh, and so when I'm talking about the analytical team here, it's mainly an NHS analytical team. Uh, Grampian is one health authority area. It's a population of uh, just over 500,000. Um, so it makes up about 10% of the Scottish population and 50% of that is urban based in Aberdeen City. It takes about three hours to get from the central belt by train or car up to, to Aberdeen. Uh, and that's important in terms of that geolo geographical isolation when you're thinking about would one report for the whole of Scotland um, suit or cover uh, managing a pandemic. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the local analytical engine we built and then give you two case examples of where we've developed tools that we've shared nationally and a little bit about the mechanism that we've used to do that. Thank you. Next slide. And so it's really tempting sometimes when we're analysts to think that the report, the analysis, the graph is the intervention, it's the thing that's going to change something. But uh, really it's part of a, a complex intervention, a journey that when it works well, facilitates a conversation and can enable a decision or action. And all of that relies on building trust and relationships. And timing is everything in getting the right data to the right people at the right time. So on the right hand side of the slide then is a description of our local engines. We built up some uh, real time local data. We had an analytical team and we were producing various outputs tailored particularly to our health protection and environmental health colleagues uh, on a real time basis for them to act. And then we had a, a weekly um, circuit of meetings that allowed us to, to keep a strategic um, sense of direction in terms of the analysis. When we started, what we started as was an analytical team supporting incident management teams um, responding to specific incidents. So it's really grown from there. The next slide, please. Uh, and so this is built around a platform of linked data. So from our laboratory, um, our contact tracing, hospitalisation, vaccination, um, genomic data brought into a warehouse and linked together. And then a series of automated reports that provide a, a window on the situation running over that. The case management system for, for the contact tracing, then we add structure to that by having a team of people who are real time tagging so putting in um, markers and indicators of workplaces in different settings and, and features that we want to be able to pull against and analyse against. And then a team of people who just spend the day just worrying about the data and whether it's right and trying to communicate that. Next slide, please. And the reason for looking locally is, well, the pandemic's not the same everywhere. 
there's a local rhythm to that. We're isolated enough from our neighbouring large um, urban areas uh, to have seen that we've flowed at quite a different rate at times um, from other areas. So that health protection response, particularly when we were in phases of suppression or intense containment, um, were really quite different strategically than, than other parts of even just within Scotland. And so it's really important to have that local focus and timely and targeted information. OK, next slide, please. And of course, we're building all of that analysis and understanding on a complex and an evolving system. So the local knowledge allows me to, to tell you that first orange arrow is when our student outbreak started um, and that we were missing lots of cases because they were still registered with our GPs in their, their hometown. Um, the, the dotted red line was a, a large scale mass testing at a food processing factory and the second orange um, marker was a, a big data issue um, in terms of the flow coming in and out from the national system. So, so it's that local lens that allows you to keep that trust with the use of the data because you're there and somebody knows about all of those nuances within the, within the system at that local level. Next slide, please. And so to go to one of the examples then, so traditional epidemiology and infectious disease epidemiology is all about trying to understand how cases relate to each other and how they relate to their environment. Next slide, please. And COVID was no different. So the orange line along the bottom, the blues are, are running seven day running total for COVID cases. And the orange line is those that we could link um, because they had reported themselves to be the contact of another case or that case had reported them to be contacts. Um, so these were the, the group of people who were identified as having potential visible links into other cases. Uh, and when we're in real sustainment uh, um, and control and suppression phases, then um, when case numbers are relatively low, the contact tracing is really keeping on top of that and these lines come close together. As the pandemic shifts into something that needs um, broader community intervention, then you see these lines drift apart. Next slide, please. So when we were doing those, um, really trying to suppress the uh, outbreaks or clusters of cases, Many of us were hand drawing uh, these kind of network diagrams to try and understand what was happening in the community. So we worked with our colleagues at, across the NHS and, and university to co-produce a little bit of code, a lot of processing to prep the contact tracing data and then a little bit of code just to help us draw these diagrams. We shared that with other boards who added to that coding and refined it. Uh, and then we've shared that code with our National Public Health Scotland colleagues. Uh, and we've used these then so we can add into that um, diagrammatic representation of a cluster of cases, information about their households. Um, from that tagged information from the case management system, we can add in events or workplaces and the genetic information. And then looking at how those clusters move over time, we can see uh, when there's a need for further intervention. So when the initial intervention in this cluster, you can see on the left hand side, didn't contain and we had further cases within the infectious period. Then we moved on with the health protection teams to, to think and plan how they would act next. Next slide, please. So these networks could get pretty complicated. Here's a massive one, uh, lots and lots of contacts. Uh, and this was in a school setting. And the question for us analytically was, is what we're seeing in terms of our cases being driven by the school or do we need to move to a broader community um, based intervention? Uh, and initially we were seeing the school cases and it transmitted in, in and through different classrooms. But quite quickly, we were able to demonstrate that actually the school was being seeded from multiple other networks within the community and that indeed a community intervention was far more likely to be successful. In contrast, the, the cluster on the right looked 
on the ground as though it was probably sets of independent community transmissions in, in a range of different communities across a geographical area. But through our network diagrams, we were able to actually track all of these cases back through their contacts into one, one big network. Um, and then looking at the timing of the whether they'd been isolated at the point that they tested positive, we were able to reassure and actually stand down that wider community transmission action, working with the environmental health and health protection colleagues. Next slide, please. So that was a couple of examples of the networks. The other one's been this vexing issue of for or with COVID. So are you admitted to hospital with symptomatic COVID or are you a coincidental finding when you've been in a road traffic accident or having some other procedure done that's led you to be in hospital, but you happen to have tested positive? Or did your um, COVID episode actually start while you were already in hospital um, for some other condition? It's really hard. That sounds like it should be a simple question, but it actually it's really hard to do. Um, so we've been working on that since the beginning of July. And, and as one of the boards then have developed just a simple text analysis of the very limited information that you get at the point of admission in the, in the live data system. And then understanding our local care path, we were able to add that into an algorithm that uses which wards and which um, consultant teams you're assigned to to help us unpick whether you're most likely to be there because you've got symptomatic COVID or not. Um, we audit that with our clinical partners. Um, we're now operating that really like a sentinel site, supporting our national, national colleagues with more detailed analysis. And of course, even today, this is a, a really important um, part of the, the decision making and discussions. And then we've shared those um, definitions and methodologies across with other boards to see if we can help um, get and translate that into to other contexts, other health board areas to, to be able to get similar sorts of information out. Uh, next slide, please. And so the way that we've done that sharing of information is in um, towards the end of the summer in 2020, we set up a Scottish COVID data and analytics support group. That's from the analysts, largely the health boards on the ground. This is grassroots driven up by lots of conversations asking each other, how are you approaching this? How are you doing this? We've got about 100 plus um, membership on our on our list <clears throat> and we meet what, for an hour once a week and, and we get between 30 and 50 people coming along to that each week. Not just the local board analysts, but also our Public Health Scotland colleagues. And that's proved to be an incredibly valuable uh, conversation that we've kept going now throughout the pandemic. It's supported by the Scottish Data Intelligence um, Data and Intelligence Network to help us administer it. Next slide, please. And we've done all sorts of things, but we've shared initially how we were supporting um, incident management teams, but now looking and monitoring and identifying early spotting of data feed incidents. We've spotted and shared changes in the trends in COVID. We've provided input into um, to tools and methodologies being developed um, by Public Health Scotland, our, our sort of national analytical teams, and we've shared definitions and methods. But it's also broken down some of the isolation that people were feeling as analysts in their local boards, all working on the same problem, a new problem under significant pressure during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. And then really interested to hear Mark talking about trusted research environments. So locally, we have a trusted research environment as part of our university partnership, and that's let us deliver at an increased scale again. So at the, right at the start of the pandemic, we were awarded um, Health Foundation Network Data Lab funding. Um, and through that, we've been running analysis that we can then do comparative analysis with the other network data labs and begin to operate um, at a, a bigger scale or a different scale again. Um, so there was some work done around shielding. We're now on to the wider impacts of um, COVID and looking at mental health impacts through that network. And I think this is my last slide. Thank you. The next one. 
So yeah, just th- this is this is a team of people, uh, and here they all are across two organisations with the NHS and the university working in partnership, and our trusted research environment, yeah. meaning that we can do that data sharing at pace and co-produce questions and solutions in a timely fashion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Corey. That that was great. So much in there. I'm going to want to look back at those slides again in more detail and some great visualizations I like. And I love that once again, learning and moving forward. We're actually moving on. We've learned a lot from this. So I think that's that's a really positive message to to end on. Um, we now move on to the next speaker, Alison, Alison Smith Palmer. So this is also in Scotland, we're looking at another aspect of this working locally and how that links in with, with nationals. So um, hand over to you, Alison. Thanks very much and thanks for the opportunity to share some of the work we've been doing locally in Lanarkshire. So just to set the scene a little bit, we're one of the other 14 health boards in Scotland. We sit more or less in the sort of the central belt. We've got a population of about 661,000 and NHS Lanarkshire is made up of two local authorities, North and South Lanarkshire. So part of the board area kind of cover, um, borders Glasgow. So we've got some pockets of very urban areas. But also we've got some very rural areas, particularly down in South Lanarkshire, so really quite a mixed population. So what I'm going to um, just talk through is some of the data we use from both the national um, data we get provided with by Public Health Scotland, and also how we then add in some of the local intelligence and some of the local data to help inform and understanding what the epidemiology is locally, but also then how we can take public health action around that and identify particular clusters and areas of concern. Next slide. So I suppose that the very fundamental basis is just even looking at our instance rates and how that compares to the rest of Scotland with Lanarkshire at a number of points during the pandemic having, having a higher instance rate than the overall Scotland incidence and then being able to break that down and look at that by the different age bands within it. And also as we've been doing more sequencing work and also through the samples which are processed through the UK Gov Labs, being able to look at the proxy for S gene status, to be able to look at these rises and falls by the different variants coming in and be able to look at that at both a Scotland level and seeing how the Lanarkshire data sits with that. Because obviously one of the questions we get asked is how does the data in Lanarkshire compare to elsewhere? So it's really important we can see that how we compare to Scotland and also how we compare to our neighbouring boards and also other boards across Scotland. Next slide. So obviously looking at the board level data is really helpful, but actually at the local level, you really then need to be able to drill down and look at the individual areas within that. So the slide that's just been, the map that's put up is actually one of the Public Health Scotland maps. And that allows us to look at kind of how our local authority areas compare with the national picture. But within Lanarkshire, we've got very similar maps, but we've got it based on the last day's data, last seven days and the last 14 days. It really allows us to drill down into where the cases are and look at hotspots. And if you do identify somewhere that's got a particularly high area, then actually being able to look at the cases within that. Is there an obvious um, source of the infection there, particularly when you've got relatively small numbers over short periods of time? It could actually just be a couple of large households that are causing an area to look as though it's got a particularly high incidence rate, but it could actually be cases spread across a number of different households and something perhaps going on in the community. And being able to look at that with the age profile of the cases and also being able to look at that, the intelligence we've got around local clusters and local outbreaks and whether that's in premises or schools or care homes. But recognising that actually where people live and where they work isn't always the same. And also being able to look at some of the areas which we have, which have got consistently high rates and looking at what's the factors behind those areas of enduring transmission and to start to really understand what's going on locally in particular pockets of the community. And one of the other data sources we've got nationally is the wastewater surveillance, which is samples which are taken at various points in the wastewater distribution across Scotland. And that's quite a good indicator of sort of rises and falls in incidence rates. And we can sometimes map that to particular areas of the local authorities as well. But we have it's a great data source, but it's not like all data sources. It does come with its limitations around the the areas which are captured by the, the wastewater are not necessarily mapping directly to 
the areas where we've got the case level data and also the frequency of which one some of the water samples are taken as well it means we don't necessarily have the same frequency of that data as we do for the human data but it's all kind of starting to build the picture of what's happening in particular areas next slide So as well as looking at who the cases are, it's actually looking at who's getting tested. And we had the change in testing criteria at the start of January that the PCR tests no longer needed to be confirmed by LFD tests. Uh, the LFDs no longer needed to be confirmed by PCR. So it's looking at kind of what's the distribution of our cases by PCR and LFD testing. And actually what's the rate of testing in the different areas for PCR and LFD testing. So as well as the maps we've got the kind of bringing up hot spots for where the cases are, we've got the same maps but looking at the testing rates over the last 7 and 14 days by PCR and LFD testing. And that allows us to look at the instance rates by the amount of testing that's going on in an area and be able to pull out areas where you've perhaps got high PCR and LFD testing or some which are perhaps higher on one type of test than the others and those areas which have perhaps got low testing across the board with both PCR and LFD. And we've been able to use that in looking at well, where have we got perhaps less testing to inform our placement of our mobile testing units and more recently the LFD collection pop-up sites to be able to make testing as accessible as possible to the population. And we still recognise we've got some pockets of the community that are hard that don't access testing as much as other um, groups of the community. So we've had a lot of community engagement work done through our te community testing team to work with third sector organisations and particular groups in the community to really make testing more accessible to some of the hard to reach communities and support them in testing and also the messages around vaccinations so are trying to have that wrap around approach and then using that testing data to look at what's our testing rates not only by locality but also by SMID, by age group and by sex and looking at who's actually getting tested and the different routes for testing. So we've got a lot of testing that's going on through health and social care. We've got the testing in education, but it's looking at that and also looking at the wider testing in the community. Next slide. And then as Corrie's already mentioned, within the the overall pandemic there's been lots of clusters and outbreaks that the boards have had to deal with as well and that really does go back to sort of that bootleg epidemiology of actually understanding sort of time place and person and producing the epi curves for those particular outbreaks or clusters and then working with a whole range of partners to investigate those whether they be care homes schools hospitals prisons or a lot of some of the factories as well we've been involved particularly at different points during the pandemic there's been different responses to particular outbreaks and how they've been identified same as um, Corrie's mentioned with the CMS data we've been looking at um, pulling out where people are linked to particular work premises and being able to tag those also picking up some of the hot spots and also the relationship we've built up with some of the large companies that they're actually able to report into us directly where they are seeing a number of cases and it's been able to then have that risk assessment approach in the problem assessment groups or instant management teams as required and the data that goes on in understanding individual clusters and outbreaks as well as sort of that wider picture. Next slide. Obviously one of the areas of concern throughout the pandemic has been care homes so within Lanarkshire, we use HP Zone, which is the system, sort of case and incident management system that health protection teams had prior to the pandemic for managing our outbreaks and issues in care homes. And using the data we can pull out of that to look at how many care homes have we got on any one particular day with outbreaks or with issues, which might just be one positive member of staff or one positive resident, rather than the outbreaks with two or more confirmed cases. And looking at the, case, the cases amongst the staff and the residents and the spread potentially amongst staff and residents and also within units because some of the care homes we've got have actually they're not a single care home although they're a single care home within it they've got multiple units is are the cases in a single unit or across multiple units and obviously looking at hospitalizations and deaths within the care home and looking at the vaccination uptake rate amongst the cases and the home in general and Across Scotland, there's national guidance produced by Public Health Scotland around the investigation and management of 
COVID in care homes. That's one area that's kind of really quite resource intensive, both in terms of the management of COVID in care homes, but being able to monitor them accurately and be able to pull out really useful data. Next slide. And I think Corey's already touched on it, is actually understanding our hospitalised cases. So similar to the work that Corey's mentioned for Grampian, we've been doing similar work in Lanarkshire, looking at who the cases are admitted to hospital. Are they admitted with COVID or is that an incidental finding? So have they tested positive in the community prior to admission? Are they testing positive actually at the point of admission? And is that because they're clinically suspected as having COVID? Or is it the testing that's been done to help with place, patient placement? Or are they testing positive a short period of time after admission? So it could be a community acquired or it could be acquired in the hospital. Or are they testing later in the hospital stay, indicating community, um, hospital acquired admission? So looking at that time of test to admission date and then looking at who our cases are in terms of their age, their sex, SMID, and also whether they fall into one of the clinically vulnerable groups and then looking at the impact that has on the duration of stay and also the types of specialities they're in. And that's something that's obviously increasing as the case numbers have started to increase in hospitals, hospitalised hospital cases again. So understanding that because the pattern we're seeing now isn't necessarily the same as the pattern we saw earlier on in the pandemic. So that's constantly shifting. Next slide. And Obviously, there's a huge amount of data underpins the vaccination programmes, both in terms of actually identifying and calling, identifying people for vaccination, but then monitoring just the uptake rates by age, by sex and by locality and SMID and ethnicity and being able to work out where we have got pockets of low uptake rates for the vaccine and be able to put in interventions and target those, whether it be for the first, the second or the booster dose. And now as we move on to the next booster dose for the older age groups as well, being able to understand that to make sure we are reaching everybody we need to reach with the vaccination programme. Uh, next slide. And just to emphasise, it's very much partnership working. There's a lot of staff involved in the health protection team in terms of producing the daily data, but that then feeds into lots of different aspects of the work of the health protection team, whether it's the work in managing the care homes, whether it's working with our colleagues in education amongst the clusters we've had previously in schools and also with colleagues in the test and protect team to tag cases in CMS and to pull off the data from CMS and to understand the trends there and then be able to feed that data into the tactical and the command meetings which are held locally to be able to really understand the epidemiology and the direction in which it's going. Working with our partners in local authorities whether it's resilience partners or through education and environmental health and our infection prevention control teams in the acute sector on our local authorities and with Public Health Scotland and as Corrie's mentioned the role of SCODAS which allows the boards to share good practice to share bits of code and to really have a more joined up approach between the, the boards and Public Health Scotland. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Alison. Once again, some amazing partnership working there. Um, now, moving on to the, the final speaker here. Um, Lucy is, is picking up on a, another aspect, um, which is the important area of the less heard groups and, and how you can capture data and how that influences public health. So over to you, Lucy. Thank you. Yeah, so my presentation is going to be a bit different because there's not a lot of data uh, or data slides in it. Um, but yeah, this is talking about the work that we conducted in Buckinghamshire. Next slide, please. So um, as part of our recovery planning, we undertook a rapid health impact assessment, um, which obviously drew on national and any local data which we had available. But we really wanted to validate the uh, findings of the HIA by using a participatory listening exercise because we really wanted to understand the impact that lockdown um, and COVID-19 had had on our residents' health and well-being 
And we also wanted to validate some soft intelligence that we were getting from um, our different services as well. Next slide, please. So that was the aim of our listening exercise. And it consisted of three different elements. So the first element was a online survey aimed at our, um, our residents from July to August 2020. And that consisted of about 35 questions, um, if, depending if they answered yes or no, then it would um, go on to ask some more questions or move on to a different one. And we had a really good response rate. So we had over 5,000 of our residents um, complete that survey. But like most online surveys delivered by local authorities, it wasn't necessarily representative of our, of our population, mainly completed by um, our older population, um, mainly by females and wasn't representative of our ethnic minority groups despite promoting it heavily to our um, different stakeholders. The next element was a, a survey and interviews conducted with our members because we knew that councillors had been quite um, pivotal in their local community responses to COVID and they had a lot of insight um, of what was happening on the ground. And then the third element was around um, conducting behavioural insight research with priority groups. So the groups included um, people with existing mental health conditions, food bank users, um, ethnic minority groups and people that were also socially isolated. Next slide, please. So we actually commissioned um, an organisation called Mel Research to undertake that um, behavioural insight research. And I'm going to uh, come on to sort of some of the outcomes of that research. And they interviewed a range of different uh, residents and also stakeholders. And we really recognise the importance of um, gatekeepers in order to access um, our residents. So, for example, um, some of our faith leaders were um, were really important gatekeepers to them be able to access residents to get and gain more insight as well. And um, our GRT community, so Gypsy, Roma and Traveller community as well. Um, and Mel Research used a combination of semi-structured um, interviews that were either delivered via the phone or online. Um, and Interestingly, this was an opportunity for some people to be listened to for the first time and our researchers were quite surprised in some of the feedback that they were getting, you know, people um, in some of these groups being really thankful that they'd actually been approached to, you know, share their lived experience um, and also responding that, you know, it was often the first time that they had actually felt like they'd been listened to. And again, I think people also were appreciative of the fact that they were just listened to. They weren't given advice. They weren't told that, you know, they were in the same boat as everybody else or, you know, whatever it may be. They they were purely just listened to and um, and their insight, you know, was noted. Next slide, please. So we're just going on to now some of the... Um, the results that came out of our insight. So as I say, this was really to um, validate the findings that we were getting through the health impact assessment and to validate some of that soft intelligence that we were getting from services. So we knew that anxiety levels were high, but we didn't necessarily understand from the data, you know, what people were anxious about. So we were able to understand that for some, it was just the fact that this was a deadly disease that couldn't be seen. Um, and so they were worried, you know, for example, just, you know, leaving the home um, was a concern. Interestingly, people spoke about the monotony um, of COVID and particularly of the lockdown measures, including people with children, uh, which again, we hadn't picked up on through the data, but that just monotony of, you know, having to teach children at home and the same routine and perhaps not, you know, being able to do the things that they would normally do. There was talk of obviously depression and whether that was existing or new, People also spoke about what helped them and they spoke about how, you know, just being in touch with other people had been really helpful for their for their mental health. And I think through this um, this research, we were able to really highlight that, um, 
you know, for example, if we were talking to one, um, you know, in this, there's a quote on there from a Pakistani woman, you know, that that didn't represent the whole of that ethnic minority group, that there were differences. And that, that's been really important as we've gone through um, our response planning. Next slide, please. So we were also able to see that we um, there was a real varied impact, which I think sometimes when we're when we're used to labelling groups, um, be they you know an ethnic minority group or an occupation, we you know the data kind of tells us that it's the same for everybody. But the the um, the insight we, we were able to see that actually there are real differences. So when we're planning our recovery we need to take into account that it's not going to be the same for everybody. So, and we also knew that some groups were more impacted than others. So we spoke to some people that were taxi drivers um, in particular ethnic groups, and they'd been really impacted because they hadn't been able to work, um, for example. And we also, when we spoke to some of our um, traveller community, they spoke about the difference of those that were on sites versus those that were on the roadside and how much more challenging it was for those people. And interestingly, we picked up on um, people in our rural areas. Buckinghamshire is quite a long, skinny sort of county um, sandwich between Oxfordshire, um, a bit of Berkshire and, and Milton Keynes and Northampton. And it's got areas of, of um sort of rural areas and then more densely populated. And interestingly, those people in our rural areas felt that they were um, more of an advantage um, because they felt that COVID wouldn't necessarily um, be um, as high in some of the rural areas. Um, so again, that helped us to think about the types of messaging that we were putting out that actually, yes, you might live in a rural area, but you know, you, you still might come into contact with COVID. Um, but then on the flip side, they also spoke about isolation within those particular areas. And we also knew that the food bank and our people that were claiming welfare um, had changed. So we'd heard from some of our food bank um, that they were seeing clients that they wouldn't necessarily see. And again, through, through this piece of research, we were able to understand that actually some of the food bank users and some people that were claiming welfare, you know, they were doing so for the first time ever. They never thought that they would be in that position, which again challenged our thinking in terms of um, the population groups that had been impacted by some of the lockdown measures. Next slide, please. We'd already asked people in our residential survey about where they were getting their information from. So we knew that they were getting it from mainstream channels, word of mouth and social media. But what we weren't able to understand was that actually, although they might be looking at mainstream channels, there was either too much information, so they were just switching off, or they were going onto social media, but they couldn't actually find credible sources. So again, they were just giving up. But we also knew that there were other people where they felt that they were being communicated every step of the way and um, that communication channels were really good. So, again, that intelligence has helped us when we've um, been looking at how we get information out to our communities. Next slide, please. Through this insight, we also spoke about the existing infrastructure. So communities spoke to us about really well connected community groups and the community assets that were available. So buildings, um, key sort of faith groups and faith leaders. And um, there was talk about how a lot of our services were able to be reimagined in a very short um, period of time, um, which again, we hadn't necessarily seen before or that we weren't um, always aware of. Next slide, please. And so all of that information, um, along with some of the national and local data, has really helped to inform our COVID response. It's really helped us to develop new contacts and enhance um, relationships with, um, with stakeholders, but also recognise those key gatekeepers um, within our communities as well. And it really was just the start of a conversation. I've mentioned throughout that we were able to validate lots of soft intelligence that we were hearing. And so it really has informed our COVID response. Some of the users that were going through our food banks, for example, were quite shocked at, at the food that was available to them. Um, the lack of 
just you know fresh fruit and vegetables um so that's really a help to inform our our food poverty response um and so we've got a lot of programs now up and running looking at that it's really made us think about how we are um our responses are culturally competent and how we are aware of different cultures and um different beliefs and the lives that different people lead and how in turn that might impact um on you know their behaviors and how they engage with services and it's hugely informed our vaccination rollout so understanding the key community assets the key um influencers um has informed how where and how we um, develop our uh, community pop-up uh, vaccination sites for example and when we host them um so you know not hosting things on a wednesday at two o'clock when actually people's occupation is taking them outside of the area so they're not actually in their community at that time and it's really made us think about how we use behavioral science um to inform all of our public health programs and how our partners use it because gathering insights so that we can understand um, the barriers and facilitators to um, people's behaviours is a key point of, um, of moving our work forward and really drawing on that, um, that sort of softer insight along with the data to make sure that what we're delivering is effective and supports um, uh, supports our response as well. So that's um, a very brief summary of the work that um, we've been undertaking in Buckinghamshire. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, that was fascinating and I think really emphasising the the importance of this, this sort of soft intelligence to support the, the more hard data that we've been looking at in some of the other presentations. Um, so it nicely rounds off some of the presentations and we've run over time a bit because we had so much in these presentations, but we do still have time for the Q&A. So I would now like to hand over to Manira, who are, will be um, coordinating that. And I think we'll be wanting the speakers to come back online so that we can actually get their responses to the questions. So over to you, Manira. Oh, thank you very much, Gina. That was a jam-packed um, 70 minutes of how local and national systems work. So if I can just get loose, if you can stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Um, if I can ask all the speakers to come back um, uh, on camera, thank you very much. Uh, myself and um, Rosa are going to be going through the questions. So you've got a double act today. So this is the first time we're doing this. Normally it's just myself, but we do have a double act. Um, uh, a lot of comments have been put into the chat and I know not everybody can ha has access to the chat um, or have been or able to put in questions. So um, speakers, if it's OK with yourself, I, I might go through some of the stuff that's in the chat just for those that I haven't got access, have not been able to, to say it. But I'm going to kick start if that's OK and take Cheers prerogative and open uh, up a question to all the speakers. Um, now, throughout um, your own um, journey through um, your, your local and national and in between that as well, you all highlighted the importance of linked and actionable data and the importance of bringing together the local and national insights to be able to understand what's happening in communities right down to households. So can I ask what's been your biggest challenge and bringing together data from across a number of systems and sources. And it could be a challenge or it could be a learning. So what's been your biggest challenge or learning in bringing together data from a number of systems and sources? So open to all speakers, but Mark, because you were first to go and you haven't spoken for a while now, so I'm going to come to you first, if that's OK. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. So um, I think in terms of what we learned, there's two major challenges. So one is getting hold of that right granular data and I think sometimes what we want is data that is spatially explicit that you know can link households or can link individuals to health records um, and that itself is really difficult to get hold of that all of the data we want linked to everything else um, and I think we're making a lot of progress we've made a lot of progress in the last two years but there's a long way to go so, for example, with local data spaces, one of the things local authorities talked about a lot is that they wanted data on welfare or income, ideally from either Department for Work and Pensions or HMRC. And um, that data, you know, is held by those organisations, but they don't like to share their data outside of it. And 
that's the sort of information that we'd love to have linked to health records or to uh, other population or social surveys. So I think there's still a long way to going into getting the right granular data that we, we probably want. The other um, challenge we definitely experienced was that when we were working with people in local authorities and the, the range of participants we had, there's a lot of people with varying levels of confidences in handling data, in interpreting data. Um, and you've got to be able to kind of showcase why these data insights are useful to people who maybe don't think data are helpful or maybe just are terrified of statistics. Um, people who have a lot of confidence with data will see the value in it very quickly, but you've got to be able to bring everybody with you. And I think being able to um, translate and explain the benefits of these data systems to everybody is really tricky, but that's the really important part of bringing everyone along to, to keep this thing going. Thank you, Mark. That's really helpful. Neil, if I can come to you next, same question, because I know you've put some things in the chat as the other speakers were speaking, and I think it really links into this thing about the importance um, of um, understanding, the importance of communication. But what, what's personally been your kind of learning and challenge over, over the last two years, especially during the pandemic around this? Thanks, Neil. Um, so, I mean, I think this obviously was a number of things, sort of technical challenges that, that Mark's highlighted, but then there's the broader um i guess you could you could call it you know um cultural or even even you know, professional challenges so there's 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 you know if, if we think beyond just the statistical data um mm -hmm. there are a kind of range of, of of data sources that 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 people have um everybody likes to think that their data source is the best that they have the, the understanding of they have the best understanding of um what's happening um and kind of overcoming that and understanding that actually um individually um nobody's data is is is, is perfect but you do get the best of thing by by being you know, able to uh, triangulate that data so we haven't done an awful lot by way of directly linking data but we've done an awful lot by way of triangulating data in terms of people bringing their individual um um bits of data and perspectives on that data together um, into, into one room and um, I guess understanding their perspectives on the issue that we're facing rather than their specifics on the technical nuances mm. of the data. Is there a unique property reference number? Is there not? And those kind of things. So I think it's that kind of overcoming some of those, those professional barriers and just understanding that um, Nobody's bits perfect, but by bringing up the bits of data together, we can make those things slightly less imperfect. That's great. Thank you very much, Neil. I'm going to hand over to Rosa in a second because there's a few questions that were popped in the chat. But just before I do that, Coria, I guess I can't um, stop by saying I loved your dandelion network presentation slide um, uh, and um, I guess what that started to showcase all of us the complexity the the multi facet the multifaceted nature of these networks um, and um, and um, there was a few points that were raised in the chat and I'm trying to kind of sum up how we can ask that but but for me I think um, what I'm picking up from what I'm hearing from all of yourselves and Cody coming back to yourself is that how did you how did you manage to make the explanation of these networks easier and meaningful? So we talked we heard about Lucy and the importance of communication, the importance of engagement. Um, but if you were to kind of sum up in a couple of sentences, how did you make that accessible and understandable so that people knew what they had to do and the role they had to make a difference, Corey? So I think the short of that is hours of time. Um, and I think that's for me, that's the big part about having local skilled expertise mm -hmm. around this being worth the investment for for the big statistical organisations is that the amount of time that you spent sitting with the decision makers, um, helping them understand what it was that you were trying to show them. And and it was it went wrong for 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 many examples of where that took you know, lots and lots of conversations back and forth is what we were fairly sure we were seeing in, in the data telling us about outbreaks in different types of settings. And it took a lot of time 
to build up a relationship t- to the point where you could say, we've got something, you need to act, we need to meet, you You need to act. Um, to lots of conversations prior to that that were just brushed off as you, we can't respond to that. So mm. uh, so I think, and I think the time bit is about trust, isn't it, really? It's not that it's just time. It, it can't be any old person doing this. It's about building up um, a, a common understanding of, of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really taken by the, the data. There's an assumption, isn't there? There's a, hu- a huge assumption that the data that in, in one system or any system is somehow the truth, uh, as opposed to a representation that is hopefully good enough. Uh, and I think we accept that when we're talking about prediction models and thinking about that mm-hmm. kind of forecasting into the future. But I think people struggle to understand that that applies to when you're looking at the here and now or last week being equally um, your best representation of a model of what you think actually happened, even though you're not maybe describing it in terms of confidence intervals or or complex statistics, you're apparently just counting the number of cases that were actually reported, but it's still not necessarily um, the, the truth, whatever that actually um, looks like. Thank you very much, Corey. You had a furious nods from all your colleagues around the, the virtual table. But Lucy, you, I could see you nodding really furiously around that. Can I come to you just to kind of add a little bit of your thoughts? Because you really went into detail about communication and engagement. I mean, all the speakers did, so thank you very much. But kind of, it was a lovely, nice ending to when you said, oh, I don't really have much data on my slide. And you really took it to the, rel- the relational part of it, isn't it, Lucy? Do you want to add a little bit more onto what Corey was just saying there as well? Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, just picking up on what Corey said around trust, because that really was key to us to get a lot of our um, those sort of gatekeepers and stakeholders who perhaps we hadn't necessarily spoken to about before or from a council we'd spoken to them on quite a narrow, possibly negative agenda before. And so building that trust to get them to, you know, share their experiences with us and um, feel that, you know, it was a safe space. I think that was, that's really important. And I think that's one of the things that's come out of our piece of work is although we were talking to stakeholders before, I think we've really um, built that trust and I think they've seen um, how valuable their insight and input was. So, for example, in our COVID vaccination inequalities work, we've had some of our um, stakeholders join that group to share with us, you know, what the challenges and barriers are for their communities in going and getting the COVID vaccination. And then we've been able to, to listen to that and then you know, adapt and flex our response accordingly. So I think they feel like, you know, they're not just talking to us, but they're actually being listened. And then in turn, we're developing our response accordingly, you know, for them. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Lucy. And it just reminded me, just kind of hearing back from, from, from yourselves, was that I was saying that data is best served, um, uh, is, sorry, data is like fruit and veg, best served fresh and local. And that definitely came out from everybody's speech. But Rosa, apologies. I'm going to hand over to you as my double act, um, over to you for some of the questions. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Maria. And thank you to all the speakers. It was really interesting. And thank everyone who put comments and questions in the chat. So I'm going to focus specifically on one question that Tom King uh, ask to Mark Green about if there has been any further come of the local data space project, for example, local authorities engaging with the ONS SRS. Sure. So um, local data spaces lasted six months um, and then it ended, unfortunately. I think it's a little bit disappointing to put a lot of effort into six months of work, building relationships. We, we worked with 25 local authorities in the end, and then unfortunately it just comes to an end and you kind of, you spend a lot of time building these relationships up, supporting local authorities, and then suddenly you don't have the resources anymore. Um, we have had a couple of organisations in what was Public Health England, um, which is now UK HSA, um, who have put in applications. So two of the regions, southeast and east of England, have both put in applications to basically redo what we did, but do it for their areas. So we've had a little bit of success, but um, unfortunately not as much as we were hoping for. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Mark. Um, we've got a couple of minutes, Basin. Can I come to you just for uh, one of the last questions, if that's OK? Um, and uh, I was really taken back because actually I was just looking at the SIPA and Westwater data this morning. I mean, I've got an exciting life indeed. Um, and it's really interesting <clears throat> in looking at spikes and looking at different levels of data really out of our comfort zone within health and care. Um, but Alison, from, from your perspective and your kind of um, the, the understanding of what's happened within Lanarkshire um, and the wider system, um, what would you say in the pandemic itself is what you've learned now you're going to do differently as we start to recover and rebuild communities. And I think it also links to Dina's question about what are we going to take from what we have done over the last two years to support the, the recovery of our communities um, and rebuilding our nation? A big question, Alison. Why not to yep. finish it off? In? <laughs> I think there's been a lot of really good local partnership working and stuff like that. And we've perhaps worked closely with a lot of our colleagues, both in the local authorities and in the third sector than we ever have done before. And it's been very sort of COVID specific a lot of the work we've done. It's how we then take that into the business and as business as usual work and the rest of the work as we now start to remobilize other services because we've got a huge amount of links and trust that's been built up with a lot of the groups and it's how we build upon that going forward. And I think also from the legacy point of view from COVID, I think we've everyone's become a lot more kind of used to seeing the data and understanding some of it. So it's kind of how we could almost normalise that as we take it forward for some of the understanding the epidemiology of the other pathogens as they start to come back into focus and stuff like that and building upon the systems and the skills and the expertise that's been built up through COVID. Thank you so much, Alison. And I know it was a big question. We could talk all, uh, quite a lot uh, of time around that. But I guess what I'm hearing loudly from everybody is about the trust, about those purposeful relationships that Corey and Lucy kind of focused in on as well. And as Neil and Mark were saying, it's about learning from what we know already and building that into what we go forward. So, again, thank you so much to all the speakers and thank you for all the questions and the comments. Um, and I'm going to hand back to Dina to kind of close us off. And thank you, Rosa, for helping me out there. Great, thank you Manira Rosa and also the, the speakers um, for their responses and um, I mean we're just almost out of time and we don't like to run over too much because I know people sort of squeeze this in in their lunchtime when they're really really busy but I'd really very much like to thank the speakers again because I know you're all very busy this pandemic is very far from over and to actually taking time out from your normal day job to share what you're doing I think is really helpful I found it absolutely fascinating um, and just reminding people that we will be um, posting both the recording and the presentations and the Q&A um, on the website. Um, the, the comments, uh, the speakers will be, um, we'll, we'll send them a, a written up version of the questions that come in. So if you've got any other thoughts you want to respond, then please do that. And we try and get that out within the next sort of week or two so people can still look at that. And if you've got any other thoughts on comments, please you know, post them on the website or continue the discussion after after the webinar. And if you have difficulties in getting onto the website, then please contact us uh, and, and ask us. We're trying to make the webinar materials more easily available. There'll be another a notice about that to try and put them all together in one place um, to make sure they're more accessible. So um, please do continue the discussions. And uh, thank you very much for all the work everyone's done. Thank you for the presentations and um, thank you to the, the, the organisers and to the participants for the questions and, and being here. So um, uh, look forward to you may be coming to our next one, which is on mortality statistics, looking back over the pandemic. Um, this will be on the 23rd of March. And that won't be just looking at uh, COVID um, deaths, but looking at deaths and mortality overall, you know, what, what the overall situation is over the course of the pandemic. So that's the, the next one coming up uh, in uh, very shortly. So thank you again for everybody. And um, I'll close the webinar now. Thank you.